a friend at uh, uh, Mary Canyon, and I do it for five years that I've been going to uh, uh, Dubuque and doing a workshop there. And and oh, I have another whole story going to see the Field of Dreams, but I won't go into that. But because uh, <laughs> it was amazing going to the Field of Dreams, which is right yeah. in the small town. You know the Field of Dreams movie, right? The movie yeah. by yeah. Kim well, Costner. Well, anyway, I'll tell you what briefly because we were at this conference and and we I said I got to go see the Field of Dreams. I whole love the whole movie about it was about signs. It was about speaking, about talking to his dad who had died and on right. things that had unrequited that had not been all this stuff, you know. And so the powerful grief movie. I loved it when it came out. And so I said I got to go there and I want to go. We went Sunday morning. I said I want to see the tour. It was Sunday morning, small town, in Wisconsin. It was closed for church, you know. So it was closed Sunday morning. We are driving back from a Duke to uh, um, Minnesota and I parked and we let's walk around and see the field of dreams. So we did, no one was there. Then all of a sudden about six or eight cars come pulling up. All these old farts get out dressed in period uniforms and they start playing baseball. They said, let's play ball. And my wife goes, <laughs> are you kidding me? What is going on? So we went and asked this guy, what is going on here? He goes, well, they're close Sunday mornings. They let us use the field on Sunday mornings. And we're, just, we're an old, <laughs> old, old bunch of old guys that get together for a league. But to see them out by the corn on, in the fall, it was just like, I mean, I put a picture on Facebook today because it came up. Uh, the memory of four years ago, and I put it up on Facebook because this year they were they were building a whole new stadium, uh, Field of Dreams, to have a, a Yankees and uh, a Red Sox game. Uh, but because of COVID, it was canceled, and they're and they're they're tearing it down. Sad enough. But uh, when we were down in in Iowa, the woman who put the group on, she said uh, her grandson had died, and they're having a balloon release for her grandson. And I do sign language a lot, so she knows I do sign. And she looked up in the sky at the balloon and the balloon release, and the cloud looked just like the sign for I love you uh, in sign language. Oh, wow. And yeah. it looked up, and it was. It looks just like I love you in a cloud form. And so it's, again, a cloud form and the sign and the signature from the person. Oh, wow. Mm. Uh, this is, uh, again, in this is actually in Madison. Uh, Wisconsin, and so I was doing a group there, and they're talking. They had a hole in one. Uh, I mean, excuse me. Um, they're going to do a best ball tournament uh, to raise funds for the compassionate friends. His son had died, um, and his son Dan had died. And he said, "I'll." They were golf buddies, and he said, "I'll never golf again." That was my golf buddy. I can't enjoy the game without him. That's why I played, so I could play with him. Uh, when he died, he said, "I gave up golf," but. They were doing a fundraiser for the compassionate friends, and he went. He said, "Okay, I'll do it for my son." I wore my son's shoes, and so I went and we did a, a balloon release on the a shotgun on the ninth hole, and said, "Okay, we did a balloon release." And he wrote on the balloon, "Stan, if this is real, you give me a sign. Give me a sign on the next hole. Give me a hole in one." <laughs> he went to the next hole, and he got a hole in one. Get out! Get out of Dodge, right? <laughs> He got a hole in one and he sent me oh, this wow. picture and shows him with his hole in one. And he said, mm. I golf all the time because I got my golf partner back. Oh, wow. Life changing. Life changing. That is the next hole after the, next hole, the very next hole. And if you're a golfer, wow. you know how impossible that is. Wow. I, I mean, yeah. hard to get one. The odds are I can't even quote, uh, but actually to ask for one and get one, you know. Uh, and here's another balloon release. Balloons are really significant too. But they, a young couple had died in, in Madison, Wisconsin. Uh, they were killed in a car accident. They were engaged to be married. So it's a double funeral, double families. And so they did this balloon release. And they wrote in the balloon, Cowboy and Angels, what they called this couple. Until we meet again, show us a sign. And they did this balloon release like in Madison. You know, then Amy and the girl was Amy, was, the, was Angel. And so then all of a sudden, Amy's mom gets a call eight hours later that evening and says, what is going on? I just got a balloon that landed in my yard. It says, until we meet again, cowboy and angel. I, and it said, love. I mean, on the, she called Amy's. It was her landed in her cousin's yard in green, near green Bay, 80 miles her away. Cousin's yard. <laughs> it landed in her cousin's backyard. Who didn't know anything about the balloon release and just said, why is this balloon in my backyard? Where did it come from? Of course, then when Amy got off the floor and said, are you kidding me? It, we let a balloon release in Madison. It went to Green Bay and landed in your backyard. 
Again, wow. you, that's why this is in the slideshow. I get this from people that say no one else is going to believe us. But when you put it all together, yes, it's believable because it happens in all the time in so many different mm. ways. Wow. And when I talked about license plates, a license plate in front of me says, Meg in heaven. This woman who had lost her daughter, Megan, was at a traffic light, having a bad, you know, you have your bad days, uh, bad mm -hmm. moments, and you ask for a sign from your, please give me a sign. And there's something about when you come to a red light and you just bang your head in the steering wheel and start crying. I, it's just like, like being in the shower or you know, something. You just like, you feel safe and you just kind of, oh. Yeah. You know, I don't have to think about anything for a minute. I don't have to drive. I can just crush for a minute. And she did that. And then when the light turned green, the car pulled ahead and it says, Meg in heaven. And she said, I can ask for a sign. And so she followed it for about 20 miles, pulled into a uh, cul-de-sac and had to ask the woman who had lost her daughter, Megan, a year prior. And so now they've become friends um, and oh, wow. each other. So mm. even, those are, the, again, the collateral blessings that come from these signs that we don't even anticipate. Wow. And this is my friends in Chicago. My my, that there's that's their only daughter, Jessica, and they were coming home from the, a conference, and um, they they were at the conference, and they and I talked this, and they they said we got to show you a picture. I go what? They go and we're coming to the conference. We're we're always traveling with our daughter, uh, but now we're coming to a conference, and because our daughter has died, our only child, and we had a seat between us, and this woman comes and sits down between us. Looks the like one on the right, the one, the on, the one right. on the right, the one on the oh. right. You see here, Whitney oh, came oh, down, oh. sat in between them, and I remember Deb, Debbie, is, our, our friend, said she leaned over and looked at De Lenny and said, "Lenny, don't you scare this young girl." Mm. <laughs> and Lenny goes, "I can't help that," and he showed the brag <laughs> book he had of his daughter and said, "Look, honey, listen, look at my." Friend. And the girl was going, "Am I crazy?" She goes, "I have a Vera Bradley purse too, and I was a snowboarder. I was in in in, in league softball playing. I was in an accident the same year, but did not die. They're the same age. They look almost identical." Uh, and you can see wow. the screen. Isn't it amazing? And, oh, and so yeah. I've included this in my slideshow for over eight years. And and Debbie and, and they and Debbie and Len go to the they probably never moved from Chicago, suburban uh, small town in Chicago, um, because of the cemetery is just down the street from their house. When we've gone there a couple of times, we've gone there, you know, and I and went down with my brother, my son-in-law. I had to take him there because we go to the cemetery and we go talk to Jess and put milk duds and a cream soda on her grave and and stick the the you know put Halloween lights up or whatever it is and just like we're doing for a living child with not weeping or crying is a sad thing. This is just a celebration thing. And my son-in-law is thinking we're absolutely out of our minds. He says, see you, Jess. Bye-bye. Go through, go through, see you again. And we go, and they said, we'll never move, you know, because Jess is always here. And that works for them. That's okay. Some people think that that is just, you know, and their house is still filled with Christmas. She died four, four days before Christmas. And so we've been down there many times, and all the Christmas stuff is still up. It works for them. And my grandchildren love to go to the Christmas house, you know, so they go down there and go, it's always Christmas here, you know, and it's, it's a wonderful thing. Instead of people will judge that as being wrong or not right or over the top, or you shouldn't be doing that. You should clean the room out or whatever. Uh, but they did have to clean her bedroom out so that my grandchildren can sleep in it. And they said it was the most difficult thing they had to do, but it's probably the best thing they've done in years. And they thanked us for actually coming down there. So all it. these little magical things that can happen, you know, and mm -hmm. just, from, just from one doppelganger sighting has changed our lives just, just as friends. And so it's wonderful. And this is an amazing picture, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it was. Uh, then physical interaction with static objects, things that go bump in the night, noises, moving <laughs> objects, missing objects. Objects reappearing, reappearing. You don't hear much about poltergeist activity anymore because it's much easier to send a butterfly or a dragonfly or, or a red-tailed hawk than it is to knock a pan off the wall. Uh, but no one had believed right. in that stuff before. So sometimes well, – go ahead. Yeah, so right after Jordan died, um, he used to wake up with nightmares the last two couple of years almost every single night. So I get up. He'd knock on our door. I'd take him back to bed. Sometimes he'd go back before I got in there and he was already asleep. So I'd lay there for half an hour until I got sleepy and then go back to bed. Well, we have his dog sleeps in our bed, little Jasmine. She's a four pound blue chihuahua. 
and she's our guard dog. She watches. She's perfect hearing. I, I say for the first six months, almost every night, there was some type of noise. And it sounded like something fell off the counter onto the floor. I get up. I go in. The first night, I took a baseball bat with me. I didn't know who was in there. And it was so loud. Shelly goes, Steve, there's somebody in the house. So I get up. I grab the bat from my closet. And I walk into the bathroom, turn the light on. There's nobody there. There's nothing on the floor. There's nothing that fell over. And you would have swore somebody made a noise. So after about two weeks of this, I was getting tired of getting up every night. And I finally quit taking the bat. And finally, Jazz would get up. She'd growl. She'd look down the hallway at the bathroom. She'd, Arr! I go, Jazz, it's just Jordan. Go back to sleep. Mm -hmm. So we continue to hear it. After about two months, she quit. She, she, we heard it. She'd look and she didn't growl anymore. And we had that all the time. Wow. Yeah. And I've heard a lot of animals will recognize spirit where other, where even humans don't. But uh, a lot of animals, we see them barking in a corner of a room or scratching right. at a door. We fit uh, that, and, right. Yeah. Yep. And or chase a cat will be chasing something in the room you don't see. Uh, it, it, yeah, that, that, that happens a lot, too. You know, the... Um, and electrical uh, devices, yes. Marshall's Go got a few of these. So we've we've had a lot of these. We we had a number of um, articles in the paper about Matt. Uh, I did a prior um, podcast about Matt's uh, passing, and there was a write up in the paper here in Orlando on a Sunday morning, and Debbie's got a lamp on her credenza near uh, the side of the bed. And she comes out when I'm reading the article about the podcast about Matt. She goes, you got to come in here. And the lamp had a new bulb and the lamp never had a short. And Debbie goes, this is like, you remember that old commercial, the clapper light, you'd clap and go on and off. Yeah. This, this wasn't a clapper light. Yeah. And she goes, I think this is mad. I go, what do you mean? She goes, talk to it. So the light's on. And I go, Matt, is that you? And again, this was the morning that there was a article. It was on the front of the editorial page of the Orlando Sentinel. It was like a very prominent article about this podcast. And I go, Matt, is that you? And the light started flashing. And then it stopped. And we look at this and we go, are you with Pop and Mamie? That was his grandparents, my parents. It was flashing on and off. Then, as I mentioned, Matt and my mother died within two days of each other. Then my best friend from Buffalo of 50 years who knew Matt really well. Remember, we went to Buffalo Bills game in Buffalo. We'd bring Matt and see him. He knew my parents I was 12 years old. He passed a few weeks after my mother and Matt did. So... On the anniversary of Matt's death, since we're Jewish, you do what's called a uh, yardside candle. It's a memorial candle that goes on for 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 a, for a uh, twenty four hours. We actually went to Israel and we lit it on the Mediterranean coast, right in Tel Aviv. But we went to the uh, Wailing Wall, and I put prayer notes for my mother, my father, my son Matt, my friend Ted, because they were all connected to each other. So I asked the lamp. Are you with Ted also? It was going on and off. And we were looking at this thing saying, it's not a clapper. There's a new bulb in there. And we had this conversation. I wish we were smart enough to have a cell phone record it, but we were just so like your jaw drops. And we had a multiple times like this, his cousin russell was like our third son he lived with us for years he lives in alabama now and the first thanksgiving after man's passing he came for the holidays and we told him a lot of these things with the lights and everything and he goes well, well matt always screwed with me is he going to screw with us tonight because matt was just a really funny kid and i go he might who knows so <laughs> russell goes to sleep 
and I'm in the kitchen area ready to go to sleep. And there's a, I know the circuits in the house because the circuit breakers, you know, hear the thunderstorms. The circuit breakers always uh, switching and switch them on, switch them off to get uh, power back on. And the kitchen lights and the lights of the family room are not in the same circuit breaker. Mm-hmm. And uh, excuse, me, they, excuse me, they are on the same circuit breaker. So whenever they go out, they go out together. Miss Book, they're on the same circuit break. When they go out, they go out together. So we go to sleep and I turn the lights off and the lights in the kitchen just start come on. And I called Russell and my son, David, and my wife. And the four of us were in the kitchen and the lights went on and off four times but the light in the family room which is on the same circuit breaker didn't and we're going they either have to both be going on or not going on they can't be independent they're the same circuit breaker and then this past week we have a hallway where we we come in through the house not through the front door they come through the garage and it's been months now where there's two lights in the ceiling and we'll just David will say, hi, Matt, how you doing? I got a picture of Matt there and the light will go on and off. And, you know, if the filament was burning out, this would have burned out months ago, but it doesn't. And my son David came home on last Friday and when he came in, the light was off, entirely off, it wasn't on. And we were just talking away from the uh, on-off switch. No, nobody was near the on-off switch, and it just went on. And we all looked at this like, just the three of us are here, the dog's over there, nobody bumped into the switch, we were not close to the switch, and it went on. And we go, it's got to be mad. And then when he was leaving on Monday morning, it went on and off as he was walking out the door. And I know this house, we lived in this house 23 years. None of these things happen with the electrical issues. And you mentioned about the uh, things falling. There was a time where there was a picture of Debbie, actually. There was in a, my wife, Matt's mother. And a bookcase behind a book or something. It was just stuck way back there. And David was home and he heard something fall and he saw the picture on the ground. And we're going, how in the world did that happen? It was behind something, it wasn't loose. And it was just inexplicable. And then maybe the same night, shortly later, a very short time later, our dog went to Matt's room and just put her head like in the corner and was just barking at something in the corner of his room, which she's she's 10 years old. She never did that. And we're saying all these things together. None of these things happened before, mm-hmm. and especially the electrical stuff. It just it doesn't make sense from a, a electrical outlet standpoint, because if it's a short, it should happen. Right. Or, or if, it's a, if it's a fake, you know, the filament's going burning right. out. It'll burn out. This has been going on for months. It doesn't burn out. And it's just these bizarre things. It's, oh, it's just one little thing. But it happens time and time and time and time again. Do you always say hi, Matt, when it happens? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Debbie does. She does a picture of Matt. Yeah. And she always says that. Yeah. Yeah. She I does. <laughs> and, and then it's like we, we got a responsive on off. Right. Well, in fact, a woman uh, just yesterday, a uh, 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 there's a group of parents helping parents heal. Uh, and they talk a lot about signs where other groups don't talk about it as much. Um, and their conference was, conference was canceled too. But um, she sent me a picture. She said, Mitch, what do you think of this? And and she has an outdoor nightlight that was just blinking on and off underneath her uh, castor bean plant. And and she said, I, I was talking, she said, Casey, is that you? Her daughter who died. Casey, is that you? Then it would blink. And she goes, Seriously, if that's you, Casey, blink twice. Blink, blink. 
You know, and she has a yeah. movie of it. She yeah. posted it on Facebook yesterday, and I, I wrote her back and I said, you know, well, that's wonderful. Yes, and it's underneath the castor bean. The castor beans is palm of the Christi. It's the that the palm of Christ, and I mean, there's a lot of other symbolism. I look at everything when I see where it happens, why it happens, and 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 I said, and I was going to call my son Casey, like you spell it K A S E Y, is the way her daughter was named, and I want to call him Casey. And then another woman who saw the post, she goes, well. M- my initials are KC too. And she goes, I've been waiting for a sign for so long. So three of us got a sign just from them sharing that blinking light sign. Wow. And I told her, be sure if you ever see the mo- uh, the book, I've got the book. It's called Thy Son Liveth. And there's a movie with Sarah, um, uh, Sarah Sarandon, I think in it. Um, and it's, but it was a written in, by a woman in the 1800s. No, not 1800s, during World War One. her son was in war in, in World War One, And, uh, she, but before he went, they lived on the East Coast or uh, Maine or uh, Maine, I think. And and he used they used to mom. They both mom and son would practice with those those lantern things that do the lights, you know, like they use on the ship for the code mm-hmm. Morse code with lights. And so uh, they, they they both knew to do Morse code. And then he went into the service because he knew that and he be, got he went in, you know, on the, in the Navy and he was Morse code guy on the ship with the lights. And he was in over in, uh, in the in the European theater, and you don't hear news back as much. And the lighthouse in the harbor started blinking to the mom, and she goes, <laughs> she goes, oh my god! And she started writing the blinking down because it looks yeah. like words because she knew Morse code. code. And it was she wrote a whole book from wow. her son, the war, saying how it was during the war, that he's over there helping. He goes into the trenches to warm up the, the soldiers that need some help, and he's involved in the war. And I mean, this whole thing, and and and, and I love the, the most important phrase I loved in the book was that it said, mom, and mom, or he, mom asked him, well, what's it like to die, honey? I miss you so much. He goes, mom, it's like a young schoolboy jumping out the school door on the last day of school. Mm. <laughs> That's the best the definition I ever heard, you know, and wow. so it, it's a really good book to look. The Sun Liveth. It's old, written by, I mean, a long time ago. And, and there's before anything, but he talked about signs. And again, the movie was really good, too. But OK, yeah. why well, we should go, go ahead. You mentioned movies because Matt was a genius when it came to movies. He was living in California because he wanted to start his movie career. And so when I did his eulogy, Half the people at the funeral were, were Matt's friends, but half the people were our friends and never met Matt. So I had to put a lot of movie quotes into the eulogy to really give people a sense of what Matt was like. And one of the movies that I used was Ghost with uh, Demi Moore and um, uh, Patrick Swayze. Patrick Swayze. Yeah, yeah. And the last scene where he's going to the other side, I put in there is the quote that uh, he said is that the love inside, you take it with you. So I use that in the eulogy. In the Jewish religion, if somebody passes you, sit shiva, you have people come over, and it's very helpful, which obviously now during the pandemic we can't do which makes grief so difficult now, but eventually people leave. And we had people coming in, relatives and family and friends. And after the first night after they all left is when reality hits because you're on your own. And, you know, we've got direct TV, we've got a million different channels. And Debbie just says, I'm going to go back and watch TV. And she just turns on TV and comes running out. She goes, you got to see this. I go, what? And they just started the movie. She just happened to turn the TV on. What channel was on? I don't even know. And it was Ghost. Ghost, of course. You know, it was like, it was the first time we were alone. It was the first time Debbie turned the TV on to watch and he thinks it's Matt passed. She goes, are you kidding me? So we just, <laughs> sat, we just sat and watched it. It just started and watched the whole thing. And we go, this was the first of many, many signs that we saw, but that was the movie that I used in eulogy. You mentioned movies, and then the first time we turned TV on, boom. That was it was a 1990. Yes, so I remember it came out. I was old. right. I was bereaved at the time, and any movie that hit me that was yeah. for the bereaved, that was one of them too. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. 
Um, okay, should we let's move on to uh, shot? Well, cell phone. Uh, like a lot of people get signs on their cell phones. Or now people are getting texting. Before I, this, I don't think there was even much texting when I got when uh, Sean's dad gave me this uh, slide. But uh, Sean died in a car accident. And they kept the service up on his phone so they could still hear his buddies from college say, how you doing, dude? You know, say hi to the big guy for me. And, you know, just college kids are college kids. And so, and they kept the service up. They could still hear his voice. Well, one day the phone rang and he picked it up and he said, well, yelled to his wife, this phone, phone number looks familiar, but it's all static. There's nobody on it. And, and then she screamed and she goes, well, that's Sean's phone. And they ran upstairs to his bedroom and you can go, slip the slide. The, his cell phone dialed out at 12.01 into their house phone at 12.01. And he he's an engineer. He called Sprint, AT&T, T-Mobile. He called everybody he could find out. They said, this is not a butt dial. This is not. This can't happen sitting static in a cradle. And he says, well, it did. And he, he, it, wow. he got, he's got up and spoke, spoken at Compassion Friends when, when he's been in the crowd because it, it, it changed his life, you know. Mm. Wow. And now we talk about orbs because orbs are the balls of light. You're familiar with Mark? You've heard of orbs? They're a ball of light that shows up in photographs. And here, Alan Peterson's wife uh, took this picture of a bereaved mom's group that she was doing. And she said, and she took a picture of everybody. I saw all the pictures, about three or four pictures in a row. Nothing except for when she said, now light the candles and say your child's name. And they all said their child's name and boom, 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 boom. All these orbs showed up in the picture. And so <laughs> it's good to look retrospective at pictures. A lot of wedding pictures are are thrown out from their, because there's white orbs in them or something. And, and that's a loved one that's, that should have been at the wedding and showed up. And But yet people don't recognize it as, as that, but as a default. Um, but it happens a lot. I'll show you another one here. Oh, wow. And this is, I was in Florida, again, doing a, uh, there's another uh, group called the, the Afterlife Awareness Conference, a conference, and they had, it was all psychics, and I was asked to speak, and I was doing grief work, but, um, so that was the psychics all over. Mark Nelson is a, in the center here is a national psychic, and he was doing readings for the people in the room. And if you can see on his picture, everybody in the room that was going to get a reading had orbs around them. And this guy was incredible, but no one, I just saw these when I went home because I wanted to get a picture of him. And I saw all the people, almost everybody has an orb right by them getting, waiting for a reading. Um. Then the next picture is I'm at a conference in the 2010 or 11 at Compassionate Friends in Minnesota. And someone sent this picture to me because I always talk about the orbs I get. And Kelly's color was purple. We set up 300 some purple balloons um, to heavenward at his funeral because um, we didn't have a burial. We, we sent his ashes to Hawaii and we just let off balloons and purple balloons. And so at that conference, I wore a purple bandana with purple Chuck Taylors, a purple tie, a purple shirt. And this purple orb shows up above my head that someone <laughs> sent to me. And they said, Kelly's right up on stage with you. You know, and it's so nice to get that because I didn't know where I would have never known if someone hadn't taken that picture and known that I'd love to see that. Oh, that's great. So host embodiment. This is where we get to physical, physical interaction using humans and other life forms. We know energy, whether it's electrical or doorbell or energy never dies. It just trans transforms into something else. So uh, it's easy to see why electricity is used, but animals are living. We have an energy, we have electricity that runs our heart. And so we're, we're connective energy. So uh, it's very, it's not a far stretch. That I think we can, these animals come up all the time, whether it's butter, uh, late butterflies, dragonflies, ladybugs, eagles, hawks, doves, cats, dogs, uh, Whatever, I mean, there's so many different ways, but these are the most common ones. And cardinals, the red cardinal is huge for so many people that never get signs or didn't believe in signs. Get the red cardinal. You know, and cardinal goes back to Latin meaning hinge and why they call the cardinals the hinge of the church. And, you know, so it goes way back that the cardinals have been a sign for that hinge between our two worlds. We've uh, we had a couple instances where we had the hummingbirds come around. Oh, yes, yes. Hummingbirds are, are great, too. Yes. And multiple yeah. hummingbirds sometimes, which are rare. Or a hummingbird to come and sit, and which is really rare, too. And so, yeah, I've had a lot of hummingbird signs. But they hardly ever stay or stay still. They're always moving somewhere. No. And it's not to see I was, them. 
I was out front. I was doing something in the yard. It was a couple months after Jordan died. One came up over the roof of the garage, came down to about my eye level. It was about 35, 40 feet away. And it just sat there hovering in the air, looking at me. <laughs> and right down in front of it were the red flowers. I, pr I planted the red flowers so they would come. And it, it, it seemed like it was 10 or 15 seconds. It, it was my eye level looking right at me, just yeah. hovering. Wonderful. And then it went down to the flowers and it came back up and it just sat there looking at me and it went back the way it came over the roof of the garage. I, you, I had chills plant, just watching yes. it. It chills. I know if you plant it, he will come. You know, that's like the, the dream, you know, to believe in, and plant. And yes, I mean, I, I, I quit cutting milkweeds in my garden on the farm. I, I nurtured them. I miracle grow them. They got six <laughs> feet tall so I could draw, uh, you know. <laughs> you know, That's I'll tell cool. you my my uh, uh, butterfly star coming up here. That's right here. Perfect timing. Luke's Woods. My this is my picture of my niece and her husband, and their son Luke, twenty eight years old, um, had taken his life. Uh, he'd had some issues of depression through his life. Uh, a real loner. Uh, they lived out in the country. He had his own like five acres of they call Luke's Woods, and so he hunted there. Uh, kind of introvert, so he built uh, tree houses when he's growing up, and but it was his area where he just felt the best, and and so they put a big sign up says this Luke's Woods after he died, and I couldn't go to the funeral. I was speaking somewhere, and I went up there about, almost a month later, which sometimes is really a blessing. You you, you can show up a month later uh, when all the other stuff has happened. You know they've gone through all that, and the shock has worn a little bit, or th just trying to make do with so many people giving you. Uh, uh, so much support that can be overwhelming. Mm -hmm. So we had, a, I said, we it, talking around the edges. We didn't sit talk grief stuff right away. I'm a grief guy, but we did my cousin. I said, let's just go for a walk. I want to see Luke's woods. So we go walking through the woods and walking through the woods. And, and she said, um, I said, do you ever get any signs from Luke? And she goes, monarchs, monarchs all the time. And I said, oh, my God. Oh, I, I, in fact, I said, I have a monarch at home on the farm that I brought in. I showed the picture of it here on the screen that I, I had pictures on a slide which didn't show up. But I mean, I had gotten this caterpillar inside and I saw him the first time I ever see a caterpillar spin his cocoon. I mean, cocoon or, or chrysalis uh, in a matter of minutes. I thought it took him forever. They just turned their skin inside out almost and formed this cocoon or chrysalis. Wow. So I saw him actually form this chrysalis. And then, it, it, again, it turned that beautiful turquoise and the gold dots on it. And and then, but it was during this color. It was completely transparent. You could see the orange and the black. And I go, oh, my God, I, I, I want to see it come out so bad. But I got to go drive two hours up to now then, Minnesota, and I, to see Luke's Wood. So I spent the time up there. So we're up at Luke's and she says the monarch and it reminded me, you know, so we talked. I'm glad we have a good talk, but I'm kind of anxious to get going because um, I, I want to see my monarch come out. I've been waiting for a long time. And so I said, we got to go. And I went home and uh, I, I, I get home and I get in the house and go run in. There's the monarch on the floor. I missed it coming mm -hmm. out. It was wet. You know, and I said, okay, well, I'll take it outside, like a piece, piece of paper, picked it up and gingerly put it on the deck. And and then I'm thinking about, well, I was just up at Luke's Woods, and uh, he gets monarchs. And when Luke was a kid, he was, I used to kid him all the time, you know, Luke, use the force, you know. <laughs> and as he got older, he'd get so, you know, oh, would you cut it out? Yeah. Star Wars is over, you know, little you know. <laughs> But I, so I, as an adult, he got irritated when I would say Luke is forced. So anyway, I know that would irritate him. And I see this butterfly sitting there and on the deck. And I said, okay, Luke, use the force. <laughs> and you crawl up on my tennis shoe, my Chuck Taylors I had on, and you crawl up my leg and you land on my shoulder. By God, and within seconds, he crawled over to my tennis shoe, crawled up all the way up my leg, landed on my <sighs> shoulder, and then another butterfly came and landed on this shoulder. <laughs> and I had that picture, but on there, but and I said, Oh my god, I can't. And people have said, Oh my god, that I've caught how can a butterfly listen to you? It's only got a brain of a head of a pin. I said, I know that's the magic of it. They have a brain the size of a pin, you know, but Luke used that embodiment of that butterfly to crawl up on land on my shoulder. And they said, oh, that must have been Kelly landed on your other shoulder. 
I said, no, Kelly doesn't usually use butterflies. That was Raymond. And I know Raymond is a friend of my son, Ron Plotkin in Texas, who gets penguin signs. And, and I was wearing a T-shirt that Raymond had sent me. It said, it's all about love and penguins. And I happened to be wearing it that day. You probably saw it in the picture. Oh, wow. And so that was Raymond's shirt. And 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 I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about Raymond later on. But um, and we talked pretty much about a visitation uh, earlier. So let's move past this. Great. Oh, wow. Uh, but an apparition. This is a picture that someone sent me. A little a girl was killed in Canada. Got her picture to the left. And she's in a white dress. And young. she was killed, abducted from school. They didn't know where the body were. But the, they caught the people and said, I don't know where it is. And we buried it. And, and uh, they had a memorial service for her. Well, during the memorial service, they discovered the body underneath a shallow bed of leaves in rigor mortis. And, it looked, and they, at the same time, at the memorial service, this picture showed up in one of those throwaway cameras of this young girl dressed in a pink gown and almost in a rigor mortis position. And it just, it's wow. amazing. This is the only one that I see. You can actually, if you see this, you can see through her, the door frame yeah. through her arm. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, she's yeah. solid over the over the. Uh, fire stingers from the wall. So it's really uncanny. Yeah. And it was just a young 16 year old wow. girl. I took it from a throwaway camera at the memorial and she goes, my mom thought you'd probably like it. I said, yeah, I, this is a, wow. amazing. You know, and this is, so this is about the only, I may have another apparition picture, but I think this is maybe it. But yeah, it shows up. <laughs> a young boy showed up in the window sill, like behind his, her sister graduated. He had died a year earlier. She was going to the graduation. Again, tent spirits like to be around family events. And his image <laughs> showed up in the window. He always wore those cut-off T-shirts. And you know your child's silhouette. You know what they look like. And the mom said, yeah. oh, my God, that is that, – I can't remember his name, but that's him. And there was nothing there. It was just in, in the window behind him on her graduation mm. day. Wow. That's cool. Ooh, Wow. And then angels and people just take pictures and it looks like angels. This could be a flash from something. I don't know, but they were planting a memorial garden for uh, one of those angel of hopes. And they were planting uh, flowers around the garden. And this picture of an angel looks just looks like it's looking at them planting seeds. You know, and it's, right. it's uh, just another cool, uh, another cool picture to share. Uh, they got another angel one. Uh, the picture they sent me, they, these boys were looking up at a bird in a tree, and they saw this mist come up that looked like an angel. The mom, wow, look at that. And, and someone took the picture of it. Still not sure oh, what wow. it is, but. Um, hmm. And this, and this uh, Marshall is what really got me started. Um uh, because when I wrote in my book, Letters to My Son, and I wrote, uh, Kelly, in February, give me something growing in the yard that I'll know it's you. And I, I said earlier, a corn stalk grew up in our yard. Well, actually, three corn stalks grew up in our yard in a perfect triangle pointing southwest. And I'm looking, putting things together. And southwest is where we had the miracle healing in Mexico. And I said, that's Kelly just saying, Thank you, Dad, for Mexico. And and I thought, oh, my God, getting corn in a point of an arrow. I, I'm sad. I thank you, Kelly. Um, growing in the yards, a miracle anyway. That I asked him for it. Um, but then my daughter comes home with a school. She's in fourth grade, brings home a book called The Three Corn Stocks. And it was about a sac- it's a sacred symbol of Mexico. So, again, I was validated. And, and I was fine with that. But then on December 1st, on his angel day, his first one, that first horrible one where it becomes so real because now you're starting to live memories of the death and not dying and prior to. So it's a whole new memory base. And, and uh, I, again, I have to t- remind you how awful that day is. But a morning dove came and flew at our glass sliding door. And I was looking at it. So I go, what is it? And it's in snow in Minnesota. And I didn't see a morning dove that late in the year before. And I opened the door and it looked at me and I – I, was, I went outside and it kept walking away from me. So I followed it in my bathrobe and I walked out and it flew over the corn stalk that was in the snow and all the three corn stalks that now had died. And one was laying in the snow and I looked at it. There's all that's left. And it's like, okay, what am I supposed to look at? And I never would have gone out there unless this morning dove had come to the door. So it, I went over there and I pulled the corn stalk up and on the corn stalk was one ear of corn as big as my baby finger. And when I pulled the horn, it was back. It was all moldy and black. And I thought, I'm just going to throw this down. And I looked at the husk. And it had stained the back of the husk, capital D, capital A, low, smaller font, capital D on the end. Clearly says dad in ink, mm-hmm. uh, in, in mm-hmm. mold ink. 
Uh, so that, that changed everything for us. And then, uh, so even my daughter saw it and says, Oh my, my, where's my name? You know? So <laughs> I said, I think he's doing really good using mold for ink and getting yeah. to me on the corn stock that I never would have found except in the morning. To, I mean, blah, blah, blah. You could break this down. You'd never be able to find it, but we did. And that prom wow. promulgated me to write my book was that sign. Yeah. And then when I was I, in, I, Oh, wow. So that, that, that era corn with, oh, wow. That's, that's cool. what I said. I've got to share this with people that other people can have. I've had the, the other ones that I've experienced in life, dreams and the, the Christmas cactus and stuff. But this was a specific request that I got and I am very legible to most people. And I've shown it to many clerics and people say, oh, my gosh, you know. And so and I still have the original and it still looks the same. But so and here's Raymond. Uh, this is the shirt I was wearing and asking for a sign because I was in t uh, doing a workshop in Texas. And, and we were talking about uh, signs, of, uh, of course. And um, I said, you know, be, be bold enough. Like this, I said, I asked my son for a sign. Ask for a sign. But be realistic. Don't ask to see a penguin in Texas. <laughs> and this man stood up in the back and says, I beg your pardon. I go, what? And he goes, oh, I'm Ronald Plotkin. And my son, Raymond, died and of the of the swine flu when the swine flu came around he he's one of the casualties of the swine flu and so um he said but he loved penguins and so when he died we adopted a penguin at the Houston Zoo named Ramona so don't tell me there's no penguins in Texas and so so we laughed about that. I said, oh, my God. I, I mean, I was just making a metaphor. And, and I'd never used that before. I don't know why I said penguins in Texas. It just came because we were in Texas, I guess. And, you know, and I, anyway, I didn't even think about it. It just came out. But what happened after that workshop now is that people all over the country now on his yard site uh, or on his birthday, they will send a penguin. My granddaughter on his birthday sent him a penguin that she won a, a painting she did at the county fair. And, and she said, and I got first prize. I want to send it to, she calls him Uncle Raymond because he's Kelly's friend. And she said, I want to, I want to send it to, to Uncle Raymond's mom and dad. And so, oh my God, they loved it. So since then, now go on the next slide. You can see, a, a, I think, a picture of their penguin shelf. This is from four years or five years of people since that workshop that have been sending them penguin Penguins. stuff. It happens to this day. People don't know when to send flowers or a card after four or five years. All you got to do is send a penguin. You know, mm. I get garbage pail kids cards once in a while from somebody else. Send me one because they, that's it. Not a big note, nothing fancy, but you know what that says. So they had to get a whole shelf to hold all that. And I did a portrait of, because I do uh, portraits. This is my studio and I do portraits of mostly children who have died. And they said, could you please do us a portrait and, and and could you put, you know, do something with a penguin? And when he loved Elmo and, uh, and and he was Jewish, so he loved the Jewish religion and he loved the, uh, he was going to be a nuclear scientist and he loved tennis. And so I put everything in the portrait that he liked and I put him in a penguin outfit. Oh, my God. <laughs> they absolutely went gaga for this portrait. And uh, my daughter thought, this is crazy, Dad. This is, no, this is, this is what they want. So when we did the, the con TCF conference in Texas again, it was in Texas, and I said, I'd like to give away a raffle ticket of a free portrait for somebody uh, from my studio. I said, yeah, just, you know, I said, I got, so two people know what it looks like. I said, Raymond, I mean, uh, Ronald. Sometimes I call my parents kids, their kids' names, but they love to hear it. But I called Ronald and I said, can you bring Raymond's picture in to put in the bookstore to show people what they could get for the raffle? He said, sure, I'll do that. I'm proud to put Raymond everywhere. So he brought it in, put it in the workshop. And, and during my workshops, I have a sharing session at the end, uh, at night, like nine o'clock at night, to talk about signs because there's no time in the workshop. Um, so we talk about signs. Sometimes I go until two o'clock in the morning. Uh, they've cut that out. They made the Mitch Carmody rule because it went too late. But um, we would sit and talk and share everybody's 150 people at night, everybody telling their story. And so we're at the front of the ballroom in a corner and pretty people are going. It's getting to be midnight and everybody's leaving except one woman who came in late was just standing there. And she said, I've been waiting and waiting. And I said, can I help you? And she goes, well, I, I missed the conference. I didn't see your workshop. I haven't been to the conference at all. But I wanted to go to the sign one. But I just thought, well, since I'm here, I'll come to the this workshop, I mean, to the sharing session. 
And so she said, I just have to tell you, I'm a psychic. And and I don't tell anybody a psychic when I'm at a brief conference. I'm here for myself. Uh, but she said, I just happen to be a psychic. And and I, I, I she goes, I, this may sound crazy to you. And I don't know what your belief is in psychics, but I know you're doing the workshop. Um, but if this makes any sense to you, but there is a young man dancing around behind you like Charlie Chaplin wearing a penguin outfit. I, go, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I, you, you, this, you can't be. This is, I, I said, have you been to the workshop? Have you been to the bookstore? And she goes, no, it's closed. Everything. No, I've been anywhere just here. I said, well, I'll give you Ronald Plotkin's name. You look for him. Um, I said, they are going to want to take you to the bookstore tomorrow. And so she ended up finding the Plotkins, took her to the bookstore, and they showed him the portrait. She goes, that's the kid that was behind Mitch at the work oh, at that, wow. during the sharing session. Wow. Um, uh, again, the, can't these, make it the, up, right? you can't make this up. You know, a lot of people might poo-poo it because he's a psychic. But she had no idea. Or she could have lied about seeing in the bookstore. But no, no, there's no impetus to lie at a grief conference. No, it's just... It's just all naturally unfolds you know, at the right time for the right place for the right people. Wow. Uh, so prior to death communication, I know we're, are we, how we, you guys got to get going at all or I can run through this no. pretty quick. Okay. We're good. we're good. Prior to death communication, that's, we're talking about what happens before the death. I'm not sure how much I have on here. We'll have to go, go, just go through the next slide and see what we have. Um, yes. Yeah, so just December 1st, like I said, is my son's angel day. And then when my granddaughter um, was born on my son's angel day and the 23rd angel day, um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later about the psychic that called me. Um, but anyway, that she was born on his angel day. And we always have a birthday party because it's Kelly's angel day, but now it's my granddaughter's birthday, which was huge, huge for us to start celebrating instead of crying all day right. or, or sitting in the basement, you know, we, you know, we celebrated the yard side candle and a birthday candle. And so it was wonderful uh, to do that. But this year an orb showed up, two orbs showed up actually, you can see in the picture, one above my uh, sister-in-law, my wife's sister. Mm -hmm. Didn't think anything of it. Um, but then go to the next slide. Oh, okay, well, that's fine. You keep it there. But I have thought I had the other slide in there. But the next year we had a birthday party again. But in between that next, she was again an orb showed up with my sister and my granddaughter at the who was there at the, with a cake at the table, and my sister sister in law had a bandana on because she, in between time, had been uh, diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, and then mm -hmm. a year later she died. So the orb showed up above her. While she, she didn't know she was sick, but her body knew she was sick. His spirit knew she was sick. And this orb was showing up prior. So, so in this one, she was sick? We didn't know she was sick. They're estimating okay. that maybe the pancreatic cancer, you know, sometimes people go a while with, it, well, mm -hmm. with funny That's pains, but really don't do anything about it until it's too late. And, and it was right. too late for her. Um, because she just had a low pay tolerance or whatever she didn't know. And, and so we found out that we looked at this in retrospect again, that some of these orbs show up prior to the death, which I didn't know. And I've had other people now sending me pictures of orbs prior to the death that shows that spirit is hanging around. Uh, maybe even the dreams that you said Jordan's was having, maybe a spirit was coming to him mm -hmm. before he even died, that they were coming to him in his dreams that even spirit looks crazy, scary. If you don't know what it's about. So, some nights he'd have two um, nightmares and he'd come knock on our door and I'd go back and put him. Shelly didn't hear him knock. I'd take him back to bed. That happened for two or three years. He never told us what the nightmares were about. He wouldn't talk. About he never them. did. Never told us. I'm getting goosebumps all over here. I, I just, it's, I think it's very interesting. When you first t told me that before about the dreams, I'm thinking, God, I wonder if some of the, the relatives, the people are going to greet him or just kind of get familiar with his spirit, you know, to know that he's yeah. becoming, you know, and no one knew. He, Jordan didn't know he's in a guy, you know, he died from that horrible bug, you know. Right. Oh. So I'm this is the part of the end. I'll, I got, I got Ke Kelly's tumor fighting pictures, which I took out the majority of them because we're doing, this is a, for the first part of the radio, but I want to explain that when Ke we, we became friends with, um, um, 
uh, Bernie Siegel, who wrote Bur Love, Miracle, Medicine. And uh, it was a salvation, that book that we had for when Kelly was sick. And so we, he said, have, picture, have Kelly draw pictures of a Pac-Man eating up the tumor. Have bind over matter. Have him visualize this Pac-Man eating up the tumor. And so we would draw the pictures. We'd send them to Bernie. Bernie would write a note on it and send it to his back. I can't believe that he took out of his busy schedule that time for us. It was, that's huge. I, uh, and so we had all these pictures. And eventually I went out to, to where he lived. Uh, his wife was dying. I went to go visit Bernie at his house. That's another whole story. But uh, he had us draw these pictures. So Kelly, in the, the pictures that you can't see, but there's a whole series of them, we thought we had rose colors glasses on. We thought he was going to beat the tumor and we're drawing all these positive pictures. But as the pictures progressed, less of his whole body disappeared. Pretty soon it was just his head. Pretty soon there was a line on his head just showing a huge tumor in the head and just a small face. And then pretty soon there was no image of him at all. And then there was finally, he finally did two and one is called the end of pain. And we thought, well, that's what it means. He's end of pain. He's going to beat the cancer. But when we looked at these, which I took out from his trunk of things almost eight years ago uh, and looked at them in a different light now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm 20 some years bereaved at this time, not just having died. I didn't put anything to two together. These were fighting pictures. These weren't grief pictures. But I see that a child knows intuitively, the spirit knows, that comes out in the art, comes out in the writing. And so his picture that says end of pain, we thought was being the cancer, really was him dying. And we go to the next picture. And you can see now it was all circles before. Now the broke, circuit is broken. All these pitchforks mm. in his head because he was having so horrible headaches. The pain was so much mm. that finally the tumor Blew it apart, killed him. He signed it Kelly, and he says the end of pain. So oh, wow. in his case, the only end of pain that was possible was his death because there was nothing more we could do. And so was, um, the tumor that was undiagnosed in his brain actually was a blessing that killed him because it, the, the, the tumors would have killed him eventually anyway, but in a lot less pain. And so wow. then he did one more after this, and he drew his picture himself with wings and his little stripes of hair, he got like four stripes, little strands of hair in his mm -hmm. head, uh, got little wings behind him, and he's got draw a rainbow covering him, and it says God above him with two clouds and a sun. And we go, oh, my God. That, that, now we look at it. Now he said, end of pain, he went to God. That's what he was trying to tell us before he died. And so it really gave us a downstream uh, uh, comforting feeling that he knew in his own spirit where he was going. Uh, so we went from end of pain. And then I'm going to go to the drawing without showing it yet. If you look at this drawing, but because uh, I will read the card. My, my, grand my daughter then at home, six years old, wrote us a card on uh, it was, uh, Easter morning. And she made us green eggs and ham for breakfast, <laughs> you know, and, and the best she could. We had it set up for her. And, mm -hmm. you know, we're bereaved parents stumbling out our first, you know, holiday after Christmas and, and New Year's, and uh, we sat down at the table, and she made a card for us out of a spiral, little small spiral notebooks, stapled it together in her six-year-old writing. And the cover of it, if you see, looks just like the cover of the last drawing Kelly did, which he did in the hospital. These weren't drawings that Kelly, or she had ever seen. These were drawings in the hospital we put away. But she drew the cover of this card the same angel with the three bikes of hair out of the head and the rainbow at top and she said and I'll re I, well, to mom and dad <laughs> then page the next one please don't please don't be sad just for me I am happy I, I hope you are happy next one <laughs> I love you and I am glad up in heaven but I miss you Next one. Oh, wow. I make Megan do it, but I put it in her brain. Oh, Next wow. one. And Kelly said, Happy Easter, Mom and Dad. She's writing from Kelly. I make Kelly do it, put it in her brain. At the time, we said, Oh, how sweet, honey. And we put it away. Didn't think anything of it, really. We were just we were so shell shocked, numb. Then we thought this is so sweet of her to make up this little story. 
you know, and then years later oh, we pulled wow. this out and I show I worked in an elementary school and I showed this to preschool teachers and they said that is not the ability of a child that age. And the way the way she said it, I make Kelly do it. I put it in her brain. Amazing downstream message that happened, you know, that happened afterwards. But yet it came from him through his sister. But we wouldn't have noticed it unless we were being aware. Wow. Man, that'll bring tears. Is that? I mean, when I go, yeah. when I, oh, I get verklempt when I, when I start, when I read it every time, because it just blows me away that she, that, that she didn't have the ability. She was just holding the pen, you know, yeah. and, and it colored that. the, yeah, it's, it's a, another wonderful divine gift. So now I'll now go is, to the next one. Go ahead. That, that is a blessing. Isn't it? Well, you can see Kelly's handwriting. Megan's handwriting, for you that can't see it, they're almost identical, written the same way, the Y's, the K's. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Then the next one just shows the covers of the card, I think. You see Megan's drawing and Kelly's drawing, how similar they really are, when she had never seen this as a six-year-old, never even seen this. So the chance of her drawing the same thing, again, is beyond comprehension. Wow. But he was showing her... These visuals, obviously. So, so when you when we were looking at this one with the rainbow over him with the three or four spikes of hair, he's got wings. He's and it says God over top of the uh, the rainbow. Then it says the two clouds, and you said the sun or his sun. Oh, did I? No, you said oh. it, two clouds and the sun, and I was thinking two clouds and his sun. Yes. Uh, oh, I didn't even think about that. No, but no, two clouds. I was just trying to describe the whole picture intact. But um, there's a lot of metaphors in that. That's another whole thing about sun and S U N and S O N for a lot of people. Right. Yeah. Um, wow. So then I get the phone call from a psychic medium. A gal from high school calls me <laughs> and says, "Mitch, you don't remember me from high school?" But she goes, "I'm I'm a psychic now, and my son died, and I'm writing a book, and I want to talk to you about your publisher." And she said, oh, but my God, Kelly's coming to me now and said, congratulations, you're going to be a grandpa. Kelly is going to be born back into your family. First time in my life I was ever speechless, Marshall. I didn't know what to say. Mm -hmm. I just said, thank you, Robin. Mm -hmm. And then I, and I got off the phone and I and told my wife, she goes, Robin, from high school? Oh, she's nuts. Mm -hmm. And I called my daughter and I said, Megan, I'm not – Hold on, but this is what transpired. And she said, Dad, I'm pregnant. I mean, I mean, I have a three-year-old to take care of. I'm on the pill. The NASDAQ crashed. My husband lost his job. We're out of our house. Our mortgage was upside down. We had to, you know, blah, blah, blah. We have no health insurance. And I said, we're not getting pregnant. I'm on the pill. And I, I said, yeah, she's just not. That's okay. I, I, I'm just telling you. Six weeks later, she called me and said, Dad, I missed my period. Mm. I took two EPT tests. They're positive. I went to the doctor and said, okay, I, I, I said, we'll pay for the doctor. Go to the doctor. She went to the doctor, got a test. The doctor said, congratulations, you are pregnant. Your due date's November 16th. Well, November 16th is Kelly's birthday. And so I was like, oh, my God, this is unbelievable. And my daughter's going, how in the flip did this woman know I was pregnant? And then on Kelly's birthday, no less. And I, so we were waiting for it to happen. But I was, again, speaking down in Florida, at, in Fort Lauderdale, and I missed – I came home, and baby had not been born. She was going they, they, She was going late. Nothing was happening. They said, well, we're going to have to do indu an induction. And then she went into labor at midnight on December 1st, his 23rd angel day. And that mm -hmm. baby was born, and the, a little girl, and they named her uh, Olivia Kelly. And I was like, I love it, yeah, Kelly. I just love how they and Olivia Kelly. And same weight, same length, same look, blue eyes, blonde hair. I mean, genetics are there as well. But it wow. looks so strikingly infant like uh, like Kelly. And that they've grown up and uh, she talks about Kelly. She looked like Kelly. We look back at the old records and they were the same birth weight, the same length. I don't remember that stuff. But my wife wrote it down, remembered it. And so uh, now I'll show a picture of Kelly and when he was born, 1979, with me holding Kelly. There's Olivia oh, yeah. in 2010. They look like the same baby. Yeah. 
And so people would say, what is, what is this? It's this a reincarnation. You know, people put it that way when they say it. And I, or guardian angel. I said, you know, I don't know what to call it. I just call it wonderful. Uh, I, 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 don't, I don't, I can't explain, you know, we're just arrogant, hairless apes trying to figure it all out. We don't know. We're guessing for the most part. So I said, I don't care. I just believe that's what faith's all about. You believe. And I believe, and this just <laughs> validated my belief. And so now another picture of her growing up, not, I, I have probably more, but there she is again. And she talks about uncle Kelly all the time. Mm, she wow. says, uncle Kelly, this, I saw her, my, my best workshop, Beyond Swiss Whispers of Love, which uh, I could talk about sometime if you want to do a proactive grieving session. But um, yeah. uh, uh, Livia was out in the yard crying, and she was hugging a tree. We come from a long line of tree huggers. And she was hugging this tree and crying. I said, honey, what's wrong? Did you hurt yourself? She goes, no. I go, why are you hugging a tree? She goes, I feel better when I hug a tree. I feel Uncle Kelly when I hug a tree. I go, you do? She goes, yes. And I've been hugging the tree and crying because I miss him. And, you know, it's so weird to have this conversation when he's been dead for 23 years. I mean, no, 28 years at this time. She's five years old. <laughs> and uh, she said, but he said, that we're going to start calling you Winnie the Pooh. I go, what? Why Winnie the Pooh? She goes, I don't know. Maybe we should watch it. So we went in and watched Winnie the Pooh. And the whole story of the 100 Acre Wood is trying to solve or fix Eeyore's grief when he lost his tail. They're trying to fix it, put a ribbon on it, doing all this stuff. Everybody's got a different idea how to fix his grief. And I said, oh my God, this is going to be a great workshop. And now I do it called Grief in 100 Acre Wood. It's about the five different personalities in the 100 Acre Wood. Each one of the different grief personality from Piglet, you know, to Eeyore, to the owl, to the rabbit. And they each have a distinct, whether they're running from their grief or they're laughing about their grief or they're normal about their grief or they're being quiet about their grief or they're a Winnie the Pooh. And they just go through life like, it is okay. Not because it's okay, but that's their strong suit. You draw to who you are as a person. That's how you get through grief when you draw to the strong suit of who you are. And I'm a Winnie with a piglet rising. I love to go hug people, but yet I like my routine. I am not an owl to sit in the back of the corner and not say a word. I cannot help myself. So I'm not an owl. <clears throat> and a lot of people are Eeyores and just complain about it. So that, that's another whole workshop we can talk about, but I want to go forward a little bit. The last powerful sign we haven't even asked for is this sign. And there's a picture of my book. And since I've been going to Florida for 10 years to the Bobby Resonity Foundation, spring and fall, and I've been, and then I, there's TCF chapters. I've driven all around the coast to different TCF chapters in Georgia or in Tampa or in, uh, you know, Miami and uh, Coral. Uh, the other on the east side, the Gulf side, whatever. So I'm doing meetings with people, and my wife said, you know, once we're down here, why don't we do something for us? Why don't we get an Airbnb and stay at that great big lake in the middle? I said, you know, I've never been to Lake Okeechobee or whatever it is. It's that great big lake. <laughs> Okeechobee. Yeah. That's what Debbie's from. Yeah. Okeechobee. Uh, Okeechobee. Uh, and right. I said, let's go get an Airbnb on Lake Okeechobee. So we looked, found one. Buyer beware with Airbnb is that we had this weird little place behind the dumpster at Kmart, a Walmart parking lot, you know, but it was, it was like three acres. So it was spread out, but it was a kind of an eclectic 70 year old artist with one leg. And he said, he said, my wife is dying of Alzheimer's. And so I can't do my art anymore. So I'm Airbnb in my studio. I said, well, I'm an artist. Hey, that's great. So we, I, we stayed in his studio and then we looked around we stayed in there. It was kind of, my wife said, well, it's kind of dirty. It wasn't real immaculate. But I like oddball things, so I liked it. And, and then we're going to go outside, and it was cloudy that day. And then the sun came out all of a sudden, shined through the porch, which was stacked full of old newspapers in the front porch. And this stained glass window was hanging in the porch. The sun came through, and I saw my son's face in it. I said, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. And I said, Barb. She goes, what? I go, look at that. And she said, oh, my God, that looks like Kelly. I said, I know. So I ran his, I ran to the artist's house, brought him back out, and his, you know, with his limpy, with his artificial leg, and he had to come out. I said, I got to show you this, and and I want to buy this. And I, I said, oh, everything's for sale. And I said, well, I'd like to buy this stained glass window. And uh, he, I said, okay. And I said, well, can you see? And he said, did you put a face in there? He said, no, it's just swirled glass that I bought. It's expensive swirled mixed glass, but I just made a vase with three flowers above it. 
And I said, well, I see my son's face. And then we put the book out and we put it up next to it. And he goes, holy, oh, I, he said, I can't believe it. He said, I'm giving you a heck of a deal. He said, it's going to cost you 150 bucks to ship it back. So, uh, which was a shipping place right in the parking lot next to us. Um, so we walked over there, we shipped it home. And now it's hanging in our condo here. And it's just, it, it, can you see his face in there? Mm. It's not all yeah. people can see it, but when it's above the green line, you see it. I see the nose. It's almost like he's got a dark patina, you know, but the eyes are definitely there. And the nose, I can kind of see his nose and the lips and, you know, yeah, there's a nose and yeah. And so we see it, people come over and they see it. And it was such a wonderful thing. And, and we lived on the farm for 23 years. I think you said, Marshall, you've been at your house for 23 years. Right, right. And we've been at the farm for 23 years, had no intention on moving. But on Thanksgiving, three years ago, driving back from my daughter in Red Wing, Minnesota, which is about 30 miles from us on the river. You know, we live in, now we, we move, end up moving to Wisconsin, which am I explaining. We lived in Minnesota. We drive down the Minnesota side of the river, go to Red Wing, see her, another river town for for uh, Thanksgiving. My wife had to work. She was an ICU nurse. So I took the, went down there with the grandkids, had Thanksgiving, going to bring them back to Mono Papa's house on Thanksgiving night. So we're down there in Red Wing. So, well, let's go back to the Wisconsin side. It's much prettier. It's a beautiful drive. And so we drove back to Wisconsin side. And all the leaves were off this hill that overlooked the confluence of the Mississippi and the St. Croix rivers. It's a very sacred spot where the two rivers come together. You can actually see the two different colors of the river. And yeah. there's an overlook that's over there. And across the street from there is a 16 condos that have been here for years, I guess. I thought it was an apartment building, but they were covered with huge maples. So you could never really see them. But now it was November, it was after, after Halloween, all the, or Thanksgiving, all the leaves were gone. And the sun was going down. It was hitting the kind of the northwest windows of the corner condo. There were just 16, 16 units. The last one on the end, there are three stories, had all these windows on the upper, middle, and lower levels. The sun was just brilliant. I said, oh, my God. And I told my granddaughter, I said, when I retire, that's where Papa's going to live. Look at that. Overlooking the river, the confluence. And my granddaughter says, well, Papa, you are retired. I said, well, yeah, you're right. Well, I, mean, I retired early, 62. So I, I, so I, I went home, first the condo so I could see it, looked down at it, got an address. And so I, I got the address and I put address into a Google search. It came up in a real estate company for sale. There was no sign or anything. Mm -hmm. And so I, call, I called it and the woman says, how did you get this number and find out about this house? She said, we just listed it two hours ago. I said, mm -hmm. I just I just know that. I, I mean, and I, I've counted it just a matter of seconds driving down a hill that I happened to look up and see it. And I said, I, I don't know. I just I, I just have to see it. So we went next day on Black Friday and we looked at the condo with my granddaughter and my wife. And my wife goes, why are we looking at a condo? I said, I told you I want an art studio that overlooks the river someday. Well, this is three stories and an overlooked river. Maybe I could set up a studio in there. Let's just look at it. So we looked at it. And as a man, I didn't even look in the garage or the water heater or anything. I just said, okay, I want it. This studio downstairs would be perfect. The look of the river is perfect. I like it. We can sell the farm. And, and, the, and the woman says, well, okay, you want to think about it a little bit? I said, no. I said, how much are they asking? And I said, okay. I, I bid $3,000 underneath what they're asking. And I said, I'll just, I'll put this bid in. So we did. And my wife still thinks I'm crazy. We had not planned to move or do anything. 23 years on a farm. We had horses. You know, we had three horses. I, you know, and, and so, but I put the bid in. On December 1st, Kelly's Angel Day, 30th Angel Day, they the people called us and says, we've accepted your bid. And the real estate agent said, I didn't tell you I, after I talked to you. She goes, my son was also born in 1978. He died 15 years ago. So I know how important this is for you. And she goes, I can't believe your son found this for you. And I said, I can. And so when we finally get this piece of glass from Florida and now hang it, uh, this is his like his third. This will be his thirty third year, December first now. And it's and I've I've been like mm. retired from a lot of other things. It's been a huge uh, uh, turning point in, in 
doing stuff in our whole life. And it's like Kelly said, Dad, you've worked hard for 32 years and on my journey. It's time for you to take a rest and, and just do your artwork. And I've been doing pencil sketches. You can see some behind me and the pencil sketches I've done for 30 years since he died. Now I'm doing color. I bought colored pencils and I'm doing colored pencils and I don't, I'm not doing grief portraits anymore. I'm doing less grief uh, workshops. COVID helped do that. The collateral blessing of that for me was not traveling and getting to like staying home, working in the studio, working on my third book, and knowing that this is Kelly where he wanted us to be. And even my granddaughter say, Kelly wanted us here for sure, Papa. You know, and look at that glass. It looked just like him. And so that is this is kind of the end of the of, of the slides because I want to show after 33 years, it still happens, you know, when we mm. listen. Wow. That's fascinating. I mean, the whole visual seeing this, the stories, you know, it's it's sort of like a um, jigsaw puzzle. I, I've, I've said this before. I was talking about Matt's passing by suicide, but I think it actually relates to these signs. It's like a thousand piece puzzle on your dining room table and you got to look at it and see which pieces fit and they start oh. fitting together and you go, I never saw that one fit there, but now it fits there. Yeah. And oh my God. Things like that. We are so on the same page, Marshall. I've said that puzzle. I think I wrote a blog about that puzzle piece thing that for me, when once you in, in your grief, once you get the corner pieces in, then you know you're on your way, you know, but it takes, it takes forever to get those corner pieces in. But once you do, then it's time. You, you don't even know what the other pieces were or what they were back then. But when down downstream, you start to go, that's why that happened then. That's why that happened then. That's why that happened then. And when this happened, this was the last, this, this piece of glass was the last piece of the puzzle. My wife and I both said, we said, we are back to where we were before wow. he died. We don't fit. We, we thought we'd never be able to say we're back where we were before, before Kelly wow. died. That we, So we almost 100%, not totally 100 because we still have our, our, our days, but right. it, because Kelly is so with us all the time in every respect that we're not grieving his loss because he's not lost anymore. Wow. But it's taken a long time, you know, to get to that point. But other people, that's why I want to do this work. I mean, still do the whispers. And so people can get to that point earlier than I did. You know, that I, you know, I didn't have to dr drink a case of Pat's Blue Ribbon every night for a couple of years. You know, I, didn't, I could have had help earlier on by listening, help from my son. You know, so that's why it's important to, to share this work. Oh, it really is because, you know, you just see pieces of your own, like, the stories you were telling, like I, I've told Steve this many times. Like I dream about Matt every night, but not every night does he do I see him. And sometimes he's he's. We've had conversations where it's not a dream; it's like a real life conversation that's happening now. Even though he's passed, we're interacting with each other. It's just a different form of our relationship now what does he look like you see him in the dream yeah, yeah he looks like an adult and he was 32 when he passed he'd be 34 now and um it's funny how different people see different things like um my son david i think he told me he had a dream when they were little and you know it's florida through the summer there's Thunder boomers every day, and you play outside. You got to call the kids in because it looks like Armageddon's coming. Just a big, huge wall of water with lightning bolts, and you know it's not good. So he was out playing with Matt, and when they were little, Dave used to get scared and, and he used to run into Matt's room and they'd sleep in bed, same bed together. Matt always let him sleep in the bed together because he was a big brother taking care of him. So they were out playing, and they were little, and. I guess during the dream, they grew up and they got older, you know, it's a dream. And Dave saw the clouds coming in and it was dangerous to stay outside. He had to go inside and Matt said, yeah, you got to go inside. And so they started walking and Dave was going inside the house and Matt wouldn't come in. And 
He goes, man, come on in. He goes, no, you go in. He goes, no, you got to come in. He goes, no, I, I can't come in. You, you got to go in. And then he, he woke up like he was just sort of protecting him. Mm -hmm. But he couldn't go in the house with him. And now I've had dreams. It was weird because when I format pass, I used to sometime dream when he was alive that he passed away and I'd wake up and say, God, thank God that was a dream. Now I dream that he's alive and I wake up and he's not. not. It's flipped. So now I had a dream a few weeks ago where Matt said this didn't happen. It, it it was it, it was a dream. You my dog went back. Apologize. It was a dream that it didn't happen, and I think I I can't tell if I told you off air or not. When Dave was home, I saw his figure. I woke up. I was definitely up. I wasn't dreaming. I literally made sure I was up, sitting up, right, and I was awake, and I saw his figure go by in a flash in the mirror and it was absolutely positive like you said you know your, your your child's outline you know what they look like from the side the back whatever you know what it is and i told Debbie it was the second time i saw it. one time i saw him leaving the room which would be to the right of my bed this was in a mirror to the left of my bed i don't know if he was in the mirror in front of the mirror but i saw him in the mirror and it was just shortly after where he told me well this didn't happen and maybe in his sense, it didn't happen, just a different form. And so I'm trying to put all these pieces of the puzzles okay. together and trying to stick them in. And the fact this happened when Dave was home and the lights, again, it's all just different pieces of the puzzle all trying to put in there. Yeah. Yeah. You're doing some good work early on in your grief, Marshall. I mean, that is putting a lot together and uh, it makes a lot of sense. You know, it, it, it's, 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 it's funny because, um, with Matt's passing, I just knew I'd spend the rest of my life trying to figure out what happened. I just like my analytical mind, I sort of like to try to figure out the answer. And Matt was really funny, hilarious. He just had this incredible sense of humor, but he was unbelievably intelligent, super smart. And he always liked looking at things. And he would always come up with a different um take on what i was looking at and i could geez i never thought about that way and it's sort of interesting way to look at that issue and now i almost feel like you know i spent my life trying to teach him things during his life now he's teaching me things during his afterlife it's sort of a synergy yeah. to it Oh, and there's a great that when you said the teacher comes and the student is ready, you know, that really applies here too. You know, when we're ready, then the, our teacher will come. And Kelly, you know, in fact, I never had it, I always wanted to have a full blown dream dream of Kelly like I did with my dad. And and I never really, it's always been signs, but never really a conversation with Kelly or anything until again, when I when I published my the, the second edition of my book. Um when I had sold them all, so I did an expanded edition, it's the one you see here. And when that was published, then I had a dream of Kelly. And, oh, my God, I, I, I wasn't even sure it was Kelly at first. I knew it was Kelly. But he, I, I'm notorious for not just wearing a pair of shorts in the summertime. You know, I mean, I, I'm always just in shorts. And so I'm always shirtless. And so in, in this dream, I'm standing in a library, like a bookstore or a library, and I'm shirtless. And um, this woman comes up and she goes, my God, you have guys, and you guys have an incredible story to tell. And I go, what? And then I look to the left of me, and Kelly is standing there shoulder to shoulder, no shirt on, muscular-looking mm -hmm. kid, probably about 19 years old, you know, and his hair is, like, uh, uh, short, but got, like, like when African-Americans have those little jagged lines, you know, carved into mm -hmm. their, you know, he had, like, these jagged lines of arrows carved into his hair, and he did, it, but he looked so grown up with his shallow cheeks, not a puffy prednisone face, and and he's and he, he looks so puzzled, you know. And he said, "Well, I don't remember much of it anymore, Dad." And I said, "That's okay, son. Other people do, or whatever." I can't remember what I said. And then he disappeared. But it was just 
the happy look, but yet puzzled. Like, why is this woman asking? Or, you know, it just seemed like this is normal that we should be talking together, he and I. And it was just so I, I love that. And that's the only few seconds that I had of seeing him. Wow. What yeah, what because I've always heard in all the dreams or people that talk about that usually, especially with kids' dreams, when they see somebody. If you, they come in the age that they were the best. They'll see grandpa when he graduated, when he got out of the service, not when he got out of the nursing home. They will see, you know, people at their best, not at their worst in their dreams. And maybe if there's a nightmare, people see him at their worst. I don't know. But I never had any dreams of him in the hospital or anything at his worst or how awful he looked toward the end. I saw him as a full-fledged, bustling teenager. And wow. ah, that, that felt so good. That's great. Well, I, I cannot thank you enough for being a guest and tell us, sing, telling us these incredible stories because, you know, sometimes you go through the grief process, and especially when you see signs, you think to yourself, did that just happen? And when somebody else sees it happen, it's actually sort of good because it's a confirmation. It just wasn't you going off the radar screen. Yes. and. We've had multiple, multiple, multiple issues, with, especially with the lights and and um, things like that, where Debbie, my son, David, our nephew, Russell, we've all seen these things. And, and we've all been there. We're looking, saying, we're all awake, right? We're not dreaming. No, we're all awake. This is not a dream we're having. And we're saying we all saw this, right? We all, and we all say what it was, and it was exactly what we thought it was. So... Hearing it from you, you've obviously done such a great job documenting this. I mean, you're really like a expert with this field, which is amazing, which is just fascinating to me. Because again, three years ago, I would have said it's interesting, but I don't necessarily believe it. I absolutely, totally, completely believe it, not as a matter of faith or wishing, but to me, it's empirical evidence that I see with my eyes. I'm a very cynical guy, and I just think the it is what it you know appears to be. Don't, I invite don't. cynicism. I love cynicism. It gives it gives more validation to the reality of something when you have a cynical view. You know that yes, no, yeah, you know, prove to me. Doubting Thomas or whatever right. in the Christian Bible, you know, prove it to me. You right. know, and uh, so yeah, I no, I love that because it just makes it more valid and and uh, I, that's why I want to keep doing this part of the work. But even though I said. I was going to start doing less and less whispers of love and more about proactive grieving because I was under the impression that most people, there's books about it all over the place now. And people have wanted me to write a book. And I, you know, writing a book, I, it's like a man giving birth to a baby. I, you know, I did it, <laughs> I, you know, I've done it twice, you know, and I'm going to do a third one, but it's going to take forever just because I'm joining the dialogue with Kelly. I may not even publish it. I just want to write it because we're, we're conversating, you know, and I'm loving that, but to actually publish it again, I don't. And, and whispers of love now has become almost a, a term and people are talking about it more. You are, you know, embarrassed by it. But yet there's still a lot of people that are on the house. So it's still an important subject to bring up. I, I, I just, I'm assuming everybody is on board with it now, but maybe they aren't anymore. Well, you've got, you're, you're such a great ambassador and you've got a great sense of humor. And I was going to tell you the end, you, you said a lot of, like to me, you know, all my grandparents were Eastern European immigrants. I'm, my parents were first generation, I'm second generation, and they all spoke Yiddish. And you, you mentioned a few Yiddish words. I don't know if you said for Klemt. Yes. You know, I mean, you mentioned a few. You said your insight, you know, which you, 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 it's interesting because to me, I, the one thing about Judaism, it's, it, it's, it's interesting. My, my son David mentioned something. He said that um, Matt's passing. It was probably the most Jewish thing that happened to our immediate family because the Jewish people have had such tragedy. I mean, you just, you look back through history, you know, we went to Israel on the York side of Matt's passing and, you know, we went to Masada, a thousand years, mass suicide because the, they did, the Jews didn't want to be taken by, by, the, by the Romans. And then you go through Spanish Inquisition, the Crusades, the Holocaust is just and a lot of tragedy, but out of that tragedy has always been a sense of 
survival and a sense of humor, which to me makes all of this journey they were on in this path of life worthwhile. And I think with you, I can really sense that a lot. You have a sense of survival and a sense of humor that makes you a great ambassador to tell these stories because you do it really well. Well, thank you. And when I meet people, significant people, like those puzzle pieces in the life, uh, in our life that help us on this journey, and what is the term? Is it Bisharat or Bisharat? You feel like you've met this, not necessarily mm -hmm. a soulmate, mm -hmm. as I think it's taken in some respects, but just that significant soul person that you're just supposed to meet, that synchronicity or serendipity. And and so I love the terms in in the in the Jewish faith, you know, and and I I make schmaltz too. I love schmaltz. <laughs> <laughs> Ronnie Plotkin called me. He goes, you're the only non-Jew that I know that makes schmaltz. And I said, I, I like schmaltz. I know it's good for you. You know. Well, I, we're all related. I, I said the I said this joke before. I said, you know, I had so many friends of mine that grew up uh, Christian, whether Protestant, Catholic, whatever. And I always say that, uh, you know, you got to remember Jesus was Jewish. I said, there's three ways you know Jesus was Jewish. Number one is that uh, he lived at home till he was 33. Number two is he went to his father's business. And number, <laughs> and, and number three, his mother thought he was God. So, <laughs> so, 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 you know, he was Jewish. So you, oh. you, we got to use this humor. Oh, you got to use that humor. In fact, Ronnie Plotkin, the father of the penguin guy, he's Jewish. His son is Jewish, you know. And he said, his son, it, it said, my goal in life, he said, I want to be the first Jewish pope. <laughs> and so I talked to him about some of my, you know, in, in, in sitting Shiva and all the benefits right. of that. And, but, how, and how do you say, uh, the, uh, uh, uh Chizad, or Chizad, that, that hum love for humanity and for the infinity of God. And what is that? Do you know how to say that? What that well, word well, is? Well, Sadaka well, is, is, is charity and doing good things. Uh, so many of the Yiddish words, there's Hebrew and then there's Yiddish, and they're sort of written the same way, but they're different. You know, Hebrew is from thousands of years, okay. ancient, and you know, from from Jerusalem. And Yiddish is former German, Eastern European, after the ah. Spanish Inquisition, 1492, the same time where Queen Isabella was sending Columbus to um, discover the New World. She decided to throw out all the Jews and and you either had two choices, you had to leave Spain or convert to Catholicism or the third choice to get killed. So a lot of the Jews emigrated to Eastern Europe, Germany, Poland, Russia, and they needed a language to communicate with each other. So Yiddish came out of that. It's a it's a it's a form of German Oh, I really, okay. I didn't know the difference between what yeah, to, like Takum, Takum. What is that? Takum Olam. I love that. For, but band aid the world, whatever it is. I mean, what is it? A lot of the old phrases. I mean, I, I the ones that I, I've said this before. You know, the high holidays are the most important part of the Jewish uh, religious calendar, and they have Rosh Hashanah, which is the New Year, the Yom Kippur Day of Atonement, and there's a part in there that I've read my entire life, which really resonated with me after Matt's passing, is that it's already written, who shall live, who shall die the coming year. And as you get older, you know, you realize you're given so many breaths on this planet. And when your breaths are up, you get no more breathing. We've all got that number. It's a finite number for all of us. Some mm -hmm. are longer, some are shorter. And, you know, it just shows you it's not the number of breaths you have, it's what you do with those breaths. And I think that's what all of our sons did the most with the breaths they had. And for that, we have to be thankful. Yes. And and for the most part, I talk, they, when they go early like that, they've lived a, a, a life where they affected so many lives. They were right. shining star. People love them. They walk into right. a room. It would glow. People said, my God, they're, and I, this is not just because they're our children, but I've talked to so many people that are bereaved that yes, that and their friends would say that, no, oh my God, right. you know, when Matt walked into a room, everybody smiled, right. you know, right. And, right. And, so it's a special, yeah, it, and I, I'm so glad we got to do this, but I got to go check on my, uh, my, I'm smoking some pork. 
Okay. <laughs> I, I, is that legal? Is that legal in I, Wisconsin? <laughs> and, well, I, you roll it up. <laughs> I'm in a condo, uh, and I. It, but I always say it's better to ask forgiveness than permission. <laughs> okay. Well, listen. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed You're it. Was it's great to meet you, Marshall. Listen, let's stay, stay safe and stay well. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye, Steve. Take care. Take care.